Hello and welcome to another episode of The Sharpening Report. I am your host, Josh Peck. I am very excited to welcome one of my uh, very good friends and excellent filmmaker, excellent author. You've seen him before. He's been on the show many times. L.A. Marzulli. L.A., how are you doing? I'm doing great, Josh. Thanks so much for having me on the show. And by the way, your, your film, Silent Cry, is, is a must-see. So there you go. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, and for the audience, if they're interested in getting that, uh, you're carrying it on your website right now. So they can get the movies that we're going to be talking about tonight. They can get your movies and they can pick up Silent Cry there, too. There you go. LAMarzulli.net. Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we're here for. Yeah, not a problem. But but actually, the, these films are uh, some, some of the most phenomenal information that I think I've ever seen uh, come from you and your team. And I know we're going to be talking about two films today, and we're doing it a little a little reversed because we're going we're gonna to talk about episodes five and six of On the Trail of the Nephilim, but we're going to do it, we're going to flip the order. We're going to talk about episode six first and then uh, later on, we'll talk about episode five. So episode six is called uh, On the Trail of the Nephilim, DNA, The Final Results. And I was really excited to talk about this because when I first discovered you, uh, this was right around the time where you were you were first starting to talk about this. So uh, take us back to the beginning of this whole journey. When was the first time that you ever saw one of these elongated skulls? And what were your thoughts back then, being completely unfamiliar with what you were looking at? This is 2012. And someone, latter part of 2012, probably September, October, some, somewhere in that uh, time frame. And uh, someone sent me a, a video and, and said, L.A., look at this. And so I looked at it, and there's Brian Forrester in, in the, the old Paracas History Museum with all the cars going by honking. I'm going, where is this guy? I had no idea what Paracas, Peru was. I'd never been there. And Brian is, like, taking elongated skulls out of a display case and, and showing the certain, certain anomalies in them. And I, I couldn't believe it. So I, I emailed them. I, I went on, you know, there was a, um, at the end, there was a little link to go to. I went there, got his email, and um, shot him an email. One thing led to another. This is 2013 now. And we mounted our first team and went down there. Richard Shaw, my good friend, who's no longer with us. And, of course, you know, Richard taught you in the way he taught me about filmmaking. Uh, we owe a lot to Rick. Yeah. But um, Rick and I were doing Watchers at the time, so we went down there. Uh, and also, uh, Judd Burton was our team's first archaeologist. Um, and then uh, Ron Moorhead and Joe Taylor. Ron Moorhead was an adventurer and just wanted to go along because of his research on Bigfoot. And then seeing the elongated skulls, wanted to see if there was some kind of comparison. Joe Taylor came uh, to be able to make molds of the skulls that's what he was interested in so we mounted the first expedition we flew down there and i'll never forget when we finally got to paracas and we walked into the museum and we huddled around that display case taking objects out taking you know artifacts out looking at them talking about them it's all in the film not all in the film but there's there's a little taste of it because you know we've been down there so many times so from 2013 to 2017 or 2020 give you an idea. I mean, we've been down there numerous times, but that was, that was the start of it. Yeah. And in the film, you bring out some uh, really interesting discoveries that uh, you and, and, and specialists even, you have specialists actually explain uh, the results. So this isn't just, you know, LA saying stuff, you actually have qualified specialists. Can you tell us about uh, these experts? Uh, who are they and what qualifies them to speak on this issue? We've got surgeons, medical doctors, archaeologists, anthropologists, optometrists, and a chiropractor. They all come in <clears throat> on, on, on the film. And you can see in the very beginning of the film, <clears throat> we, we just cut very quickly, very staccato-like, through all these different people. And they're saying, it's genetic. We don't have these features. This is a new species. Um, it has to be genetic. You know, this type, these type of statements in the very beginning of the film. So we whet the viewer's appetite, um, and hopefully they'll hang with us for the rest of the film. But, yeah, I mean, it is genetic. Something else is going on here. And all these professionals, that's why, we, that's why I did it, because I wanted to get a multidiscipline approach to this phenomenon, not just an archaeologist or an anthropologist. Mondo Gonzalez was our lead archaeologist who got us, was able to get the permits 
Shakur from Peru. Rick Woodward is our lead anthropologist on the team. He was the one who discovered the placement of the foramen magnum and why that matters so much. And then, like, you know, we had, we had all these doctors that came on. Just incredible. And I would, I would show them the artifact, and they would look at them and go, and they would just start deconstructing it. And they all came up with the same thing. This is not the result of cranial deformation, cradle headboarding. You see, if you're an archaeologist and you and you you go through the classes, then what you're taught is that elongated skulls are the results of cranial deformation, cradle headboarding. When they take an infant, they wrap the head, put pressure on it, and mold mold the shape of it. We're not denying that that exists because we know it does. Question is, what are they emulating? And are, is there something else going on here? And what we discover with the Paracas people is not the result of cranial deformation or cradle headboarding. It is, in fact, genetic. Yeah, tell us about some of the uh, specific skulls themselves. In case somebody is watching and they're kind of brand new to this topic and may not have seen one, uh, how many have been found? There you go. <laughs> how many of these things have been found? Like, how old are they? And about what age do the subjects appear to be? Or is it varied? It, it's completely varied. It's all over the map. And the bottom line is, you know, what, what we're looking at here um, is, I hope it keeps going away, but but this is an elongated skull, which is what the people call uh, the cinnamon skull. And I'm going to walk you through some of the anomalous features that you have here. First, let's go, and my background is not helping. Can you still see the skull? Yeah, it keeps disappearing. It it's, disappearing? Probably, it's probably reflecting your okay. uh, green screen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Um, let me try this then. The first thing I want to call your attention to is the elongation of it, how, how inc incredibly elongated it is. Let's start with the frontal plate right here. Notice how absolutely large, much larger than mine. I mean, I'm going to put it, put it, I'm going to put it next to mine, my head, and, and it gives you an idea what you're looking at here. Uh, and then, and then look, at, look at the way this, people say, well, that's because they bound the head here. Or they bound the head here. Well, not so fast, citizen. You know, that's, that's all conjecture. We're looking at this, and we're saying it's all, all wrong. Many of the Paracas skulls did not have a sagittal suture. In my head, and your skull right now, there's a suture that goes from right here, goes, splits, splits the, the top, goes right on the, it's called the sagittal suture, right on top of the head and goes back to the rear plate. So this is a suture right here. These are sutures in the rear of the skull, as you can see, all right? So this skull should have a suture from this point right here, and it should go all the way back. Guess what? There it is. And there's not even a vestige of it. There is a disease called craniosynatosis. But when craniosynatosis occurs, you usually get something that looks like this. It'll, it'll kind of ridge up where that was, where the suture once was. You'll still see vestiges of it. Here, you don't see anything, not, e not even remotely a trace. So the first thing is there's no sagittal suture. And the suturing of the rest of the skull is basically all wrong. One of the biggest smoking guns that we discovered, and this is the work of our anthropologist, Rick Woodward, that when he examined, I sent him four or five molds, and by the way, the mold you're looking at was done by Joe Taylor. Uh, he molded all the skulls, including this one. He's an expert at it. So what, what, what Rick discovered was, let's turn the skull over and look at the bottom, base of a skull, which is what he did. This hole right here, and uh, Joe has created a, a hole so he could put the dowel in it. But you can see that the outer rim is where the foramen magnum would be, right there. So he's filled it in and made a hole. But this is where the foramen magnum sits on this creature. Well, it's all wrong. The foramen magnum should be here in the center of the skull. You cannot move the foramen magnum through cradle headboarding. In other words, this thing is, is already determined before birth in the womb. So it's here. It's all the way in the back. You can see it right there. It's all the way in the back of the skull. If it's any further back, it's outside the skull. My skull and your skull, our foramen magnum is right here, right, right, where that, right where that red point is, right about there, the center of the skull, which would be here. That would balance the skull very nicely. This is all the way in the back. 
And we've had medical doctors look at this and, and basically say, well, you'd have to have a, com uh, a compensatory effect to balance the skull, which may necessitate a longer neck. And we'll get into what that might mean. Now, we can't prove that, but something's going on here. And so you've got the placement of the foramen magnum. Then you've got the orbits of the eyes. Our optometrist who comes on the record, Dr. Jeff Duff, examine these and other skulls. First of all, the orbits, as you can see here, are 25 to 30 percent larger than a normal human being. And also the pupillary distance, the PD, in a normal human being between the center of the pupil should be about 60 to 65 millimeters. These are 40 to 45 millimeters. So you've got a huge discrepancy there. And I asked Dr. Jeff, I said, well, okay, that's real. What does that mean to the layperson? He said, more than likely, these entities would be able to see in the dark. They would have nocturnal vision, essentially night vision. And when Tim Alberino and I were down in 2019, Tim's archaeologist took us to a place called the Reserve outside Paracas, where the last vestiges of the Paracas entities' homes still are. They lived underground, Josh. They lived underground. Now we know that for a fact. And that uh, there's no, I, I asked the archaeologist, I said, is there evidence of torchlight? So they could see. He said, no, there's, there's no evidence of any of that. So that, that's what we're looking at. And it's absolutely unbelievable. And, and those are just some of the genetic anomalies that, that we're looking at with these very extremely enigmatic elongated skulls. Uh, I firmly believe they are not human. They are a different species, that this is something genetic. I'll stake my reputation after seven years and the evidence that we have, I believe it's a preponderance of evidence that specifically shows that these entities are not uh, human beings as we know it. They are in fact something else. And I would even go so far to state that they are perhaps the Horites. Horites were one of the Nephilim tribes and Horite means cave dweller. So, you know, I can't prove that, but there's enough genetic anomalies here to tell me that I'm looking at something that's not human. And, and could these, because uh, I don't know anything about, um, you know, I don't have a medical background and mo most of the audience uh, don't either, but, but you've had experts on the film that do have medical backgrounds. Could any of these be explained just by uh, deformities or would it be like multiple deformities where you would have to find the same set of deformities throughout all these skulls and then the chances of that are, are just impossible or is it, a, or is it a whole bunch of different ones? Well, they, they pretty much, the ones in Paracas have these features. Mm -hmm. And then it all disappears. It all just kind of goes away. And we don't know, no one knows what happened to the Paracas people. They seemingly just vanish, just completely vanish. So, you know, we don't know. But we know enough that we've seen many of the Paracas skulls without a sagittal suture and the foramen magnum being pushed all the way back to the rear, the occipital plate, the rear of the skull. Right. So we know that something is going on. And, um, you know, it's... It's not the status quo by any means. Right, because you, usually with genetic deformities, you'll have like, you know, one out of a million or something like that that has something weird with their skeleton. It's okay for me to say that because I'm, I'm actually of that group. I'm, in, I'm a one in a million case with Trevor's disease. So, it, you know, when my time comes and people uh, dig up my bones, uh, you know, in a thousand years or whatever, there's going to be something strange. But what they're not going <laughs> to find, <laughs> what they're not going to find is several other people with the same thing next to me. You know, usually those cases are like one in a million. So it, it seems like if this was just a genetic deformity and it wasn't anything abnormal, that you would find maybe one or two or and they would be far apart. But it seems like there's a lot of these things and they all have the same strange uh, features. Is, is that what leads you to believe that this is something other than human? Well, I, I, I mean, absolutely. This is, look, it fits the timeline. These entities show up uh, in Paracas, Peru about 3,500 years ago which fits the timeline of Joshua and Caleb going into the Levant. I mean, we know it, we don't know the precise date, but they're not, they're not Amerindians. And our DNA samples that we took specifically show that. I mean, you know, how many DNA samples do we have to take before academia takes notice? But they don't want to take notice 
because they have their own agenda. They're not interested in the truth. They're interested in upholding their agenda, with all due respect. We took 58 samples, DNA samples. Mondo and I went down there. We were in full lab gear. Our, our heads were covered. We had eyeglasses on, you know, masks on, full-on lab suits, double arms, gloves, the whole nine yards. And we changed out of those lab suits for every single skull that we took samples of. We took samples of 18 different elongated skulls, nine from the Ica Museum, nine from Senior Juan's Museum. And the results were all over the map. But we had enough of them, enough of the skulls to show a Eastern European, European, Middle Eastern, um, you know, an anomaly, haplogroup, which comes from the female side of the family. So, you know, out of the 58 samples we took, 28 of them sequenced. Out of the 28, a preponderance of them showed a Middle Eastern slash, um, you know, European haplogroup from the maternal side, from the mother's side, mitochondrial DNA. And that rewrites history. But they don't want that to rewrite history. As far as I know, our team is the only team on record that has that type of, you know, 18 different skulls and, and with 58 samples. Nobody else has done that. There was one guy from UCLA which claimed to have done that, but when we pressed him, how many elongated skulls from Paracas did you actually test? He completely went dark. And that's the way the game is played. Uh, they're not, you know, everybody's fighting for tenure and money, and, and not very many people are looking for the truth. I'm looking for the truth. If I'm wrong, I'll admit it. But the DNA and the machine doesn't lie. You put the sample in the machine, the machine doesn't care about my worldview or my personal beliefs or what I uphold and, and believe is true. You care less. It spits out the data. And that's what we reported. We report the data. In the film, we show it. And again, um, many of the, of the skulls showed a Middle Eastern European haplogroup that rewrites history. The skeptics will say, well, no, it doesn't. Prove me wrong. You go out. You go down to Peru, you get the permits, you do your own tests, and then tell us where we're going wrong. Just don't sit there behind your armchair and say, oh, it was all contaminated. Because if it was contaminated, we would have had nuclear DNA. We had no nuclear DNA. So that, that the straw man argument, so easy to make by the critics, but it holds no weight. Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely want to get more into the DNA. But first, you said something really interesting. You mentioned something about long necks, that it would require a long neck to support this kind of uh, skull with where the placement is. And even in some ancient drawings, like you, you look at the ancient Egyptians and their and how they're portrayed. I mean, they have these long skulls and it, it seems like their head is like way back, just, you know, maybe for balance. I don't know. But what what would the neck structure have to have to look like to even be able to have a skull? all like this work on uh, a type of humanoid body. Yeah, and we've got medical doctors, and again, our, our anthropo anthropologists, our chiropractor, um, Malcolm comes on, and basically it, it, would, ha it would necessitate a longer neck uh, at, at some level to balance this thing. Otherwise, look, according to, and we show this in the film, where the skull is, it would be like this, looking down, Okay just based on where the foramen magnum is. It would be looking down like this. So you can't have that. So it's got to have a longer neck to balance it. And that's what we think happened. We think it had a longer neck. And what's interesting, the Anakim, which is one of the Nephilim tribes in the Levant, when Joshua and Caleb um, pressed the conquest of Canaan, uh, Anakim means long neck. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And um, now I know we can't reveal everything. We got, we got, you know, it, it's it's a long movie. It's a great movie, and people got to get the movie to get all Thank the you. results. Uh, but um, you you tell the you go through the whole journey of uh, trying to get this DNA examined. Um, and you you just talked about a little bit about it. But how, how did you extract DNA from it? What was the process like? And, and uh, what, what labs did you send it to? Did they even know what they were receiving, or did you give it to them anonymously? How how did that whole process work? We gave um, samples to one lab, which won't have anything to do with us anymore, uh, here in the States. Actually, two labs. They won't touch us with a 10-foot pole, which is discriminatory. Yeah. Why, why are you discriminating against me? I, I, I have permits. I did it legally. And you won't test my samples? I mean, I could go to a court of law and say these people are discriminating against me because of my religious belief, because that's what it is. 
if I wasn't a Christian, right, and, and looking at the biblical narrative, they, they would be more than welcome to have me come in. But because I'm a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, and my hypothesis, which is a scientific method, is that these are the remnants of the Nephilim. They don't want anything to do with me. That's discriminating. And I, I'm actually thinking about bringing a lawsuit against these labs. Not that I would win, not that I want any money, just test my samples and do it in an above-board way and quit poisoning the well for other labs. So these two, these, these two labs that tested things for us, they will no longer get near us. But they tested the baby mommy skull, which we unwrapped, and it was U2E1. They had no idea what they were testing. We tested it three different times, two different labs. The other that lab was Paleo DNA in Canada, who will run our samples, at least so far. And it came back, in, again, three different tests, two different labs, U2E1, which is Eastern Europe. Well, that rewrites history. Now, you can, say, you can give me the straw man argument, oh, it's contaminated. Well, why is it contaminated? You know, why, why do we believe that you say it's contaminated? We say it's not. So who, who are we to believe? When our protocols were stringent and above board and as good as anybody else could do, and we did, we did the test three different times, two different labs. So what's it contaminated with? That's Eastern European. That shouldn't be there. It should not be there, and yet it's there. So, and that wasn't, that wasn't the only skull. The other two skulls that came from that same grave, we also tested. They came up U2E1. Apparently, it was like a family grave. And we had samples of all three, and they all came back U2, U2E1. So there you go. I was going to ask you what what is the most shocking thing that came out, but I do want to I do want to uh, have people get the movie. So what what was the second most shocking thing that uh, came out in uh, this film? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, the, to me, the foramen magnum uh, is is a smoking gun. The placement of the foramen magnum is a smoking gun. There's no doubt about it. But when you and remember as and you're an editor, you're a director, so you know you know what we go through. Oh yeah. We watch and watch and watch and watch and watch and go over and over and over again. We live and breathe the film until it's done. Um, and so there were many aha moments, but it, it just got to the point, and you can call it brainwashing myself, but I got to the point where I just went, there's just a, a preponderance of evidence that point to a genetic aberration, a new species, something that is not human. It's not human. So it was sort of like a culmination of everything, all the experts, all these different disciplines brought to bear on, on the elongated skulls that just, I just went, oh my gosh, it's true. Now the academia may never embrace it. I really don't care. I've done my homework. Um, and by the way, you know, this, this wasn't some afternoon lark. This was a seven year study on and off seven-year study, and it cost tens of thousands of dollars. And I want to thank our donors who still remain anonymous for, it was a couple that gave us lots and lots and lots of money to be able to do this. We were able to mount the teams to go down to Peru. And every time you go down there, it's 15 to 20 grand with three or four or five people. If it's five, it's more, you know, and, and, and all this stuff. Um, labs are not cheap. So it, it adds up. And uh, we went through a lot of money. But I think the results speak for themselves that, um, you know, we, what we uncovered, in my opinion, were either the Anakim or the Horites. People go, well, the Nephilim were giants. No, some of them were giants, not all. And that's why there's different, the different tribes that seem to have different characteristics. In other words, Anakim means long neck. It doesn't necessarily mean giant. But we know that the giants were there. So it's not either or, it's both and. And unfortunately, more, more information needs to be uncovered. But when these things are uncovered, it's immediately you know, swept under the rug, whisked away to some museum, and, and the public never hears about it. So you know, our team was really the first team to go in and, uh, and, and look at these very enigmatic skulls, weigh in on them, and then report back, and that's all in the film. 
Well, it's a, very, it's a very well put together film. You you and your team did a phenomenal job. Um, I really believe that Richard would Thank have been. You, uh, oh, you're welcome. I, I really believe Richard would have been proud of that. And I, I loved the the uh, memorial at the end that you guys put in there. Beautifully done. Um, where can Thank people? You. Uh, Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, where can people find the movie? And uh, where can they follow you online and support you? Well, there's there's two ways to get it. If you want to get the hard copy, you go to lamarzuli.net. L a marzuli dot net and you can buy um there's now six episodes in the series i'm working on number seven and eight and uh <clears throat> you can procure the hard copies if you want instant gratification a streaming site streaming dot la marzuli dot net streaming dot la marzuli dot net you can download all six and, and binge watch them for under 25 dollars i think so pretty cool Awesome. Fantastic. Well, I highly suggest everybody watching go and do that. Uh, we got a lot more to talk about because L.A. also has another film, Episode 5, Access Monday, the Monday, the center of the world. But we are going to save that for members only. So if you're not a member, head on over to DailyRenegade.com and get a membership today. It's only $10 a month or $100 a year. If you can afford it, get that because then you get two months for free. You just pay for it once. You don't have to think about it for a whole year. It's a great deal. And uh, just a reminder, we're doing that because YouTube got in the nasty habit of deleting our videos. We want to be able to protect our content. We want to be able to say whatever we want to say when we want to say it. Uh, and Christianity, just by nature, is controversial to the world. So if we want the freedom to be able to uh, speak our minds and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, to any and all who will listen, sometimes it costs money to do that. So uh, in order to house our videos, we do that over at DailyRenegade.com, uh, where YouTube can't touch it. They probably will uh, delete this channel because they deleted our last one. And uh, so if they do, just head on over to dailyrenegade.com. You'll be able to find all of the full versions of our videos, all of the full episodes of every show we have. It's not just Sharpening Report. Uh, we also have um, JPD Weekly. We have Christian Contrarian with Gary Wayne. We have uh, Christian Marauder with uh, Brian Melvin, several others. Make sure you check that out, dailyrenegade.com. All right. If you are a member, hold on the line and everybody viewing for free. Thank you so much. And until next time, take care and God bless.